Now let's talk about one of those issues that drives us physicists nuts. Well, it's not actually it drives us nuts, it drives physics teachers at high school nuts. And most of you have probably mentioned centrifugal force and the high school teacher's gone, ah, there's no such thing as centrifugal force. And we can say right now, they are wrong. There is a such a thing as a centrifugal force, but you must be in an accelerating frame to experience it. So centrifugal force is a virtual force. What that means is if you're in an inertial room, if you're in an inertial frame, like sitting in a classroom, which is not, you're not really feeling centrifugal force. We'll actually make a slight exception to that short. But if you're in a car that's going around a corner, you get thrown against the car door. So if inside that frame of reference, inside the car, you're feeling a force pushing you out the door, and we call that centrifugal force. But because you can only observe that force while in the car, we call it a virtual force. So, so basically, centrifugal force, centrifugal force, is the same magnitude or the same size as centripetal force, as the centripetal force, but the opposite direction. And that's really important. I mean, if you don't have centrifugal force, how would things like centrifuges work, you know? So, uh, one of the things we're talking about, like, let's actually apply this to a case. It, one of the um, things that they've noticed on space station up on ISS and things like that, if you're in weightlessness for a long time, then basically you get calcium deficiency and blood pressure problems and you can actually go blind. Chris Hadfield went blind because he was in zero G too long. So what's the answer? Well, one of the early answers being proposed is you have your space station and you spin it. And therefore, you'll experience an artificial gravity. And that artificial gravity is actually supplied by the centrifugal force. So let's take an example. Let's figure out what the force would be. So what we have here, let's take, um, let's do example 6.7. And we have space station, space station R equals one kilometer. And let's be honest, it doesn't have to be a solid structure. You can have that on the tether. You can have that like two weights on a piece of string spinning around each other. Um, rotates at one RPM, one revolution per minute. What's the magnitude of the artificial? What is the centrifugal force? So, what would the experience of uh, centrifugal force? Well, we know from other stuff that acceleration, uh, do we have a mass? Well, we just, what is the acceleration um, caused acceleration? How does that sound? We want to know what the acceleration is. We don't actually have a mass as such. So acceleration for stuff spinning around a circle is equal to V squared over R. So we know what R is. R, R equals one kilometer, 1,000 meters. Remember, if in doubt, always go back to meters and kilograms and seconds. What's the velocity equal to? Well, V is equal to distance over time. Well, in this case, the distance is going to be, because we know what R is, it's going to be 2 pi R over time. So the velocity is going to be 2 pi times 1,000 meters all over the time, which is 60 seconds. So, let's get that into a calculator. 2,000 times pi divided by 60 equals 104.72 meters per second. 
So let's go and stick this in the equation and find out what happens. We've got 104.72 meters per second. Uh, well that's going to be squared, don't forget to square it, over 1000 meters, which is the size. Stick that in the calculator, we square the answer equals, divide that by 1000 equals 10.966 meters per second squared. Let's just round that to 11. So something that big travelling that slowly is going to produce 11 meters per second. And it has to travel reasonably slowly. If you do more than about 6 RPM, then humans just don't adapt to it. So you need a nice slow spin rate, something like that. Okay, so that's so let's just carry on just a little bit further. Uh, so if we're sitting in a classroom or if I'm sitting here with a piece of paper, let's draw us there, and there's me in my classroom or at home because I'm under quarantine. Well, the whole country's under quarantine. Um, self isolation has that sound. Um Am I in an inertial frame, or am I in a non-inertial frame? And as a general rule, for all experiments and things, we count ourselves as an inertial frame. We go into a laboratory and we do experiments. We usually consider that an inertial frame. Is that true? And, well, the answer is no. We're not strictly an inertial frame because the Earth rotates. And not only that, that's the biggest effect. The Earth also goes around the Sun. So therefore it's also got a centrifugal force caused by the rotation. So there's a centrifugal force caused by the Earth spinning and a centrifugal force by the fact that the Earth is moving around the Sun. Then there's a centrifugal force which is probably indetectable but caused by the fact that the Sun moves around our solar system, uh, moves around a galaxy. So Let's actually work out what the size of the centrifugal force for the Earth is. So A is equal to V squared over R. Well, how fast is the Earth actually spinning? Well, that's going to equal, well, again, um, we've actually got this written down here. So the Earth is actually 6,300 kilometres. So remember, so V is going to be equal to distance, 2 pi r, over time, squared, all over the uh, radius, which is going to be related to that, which is, let's carry this on. Well, if I go, let's see, because that's all multiplication division, I can just square everything in the bracket. So it's going to equal 4 because 2 squared is 4, pi squared, r squared, well what's r? So, yeah, no, let's just leave this, let's actually leave this for a second over t squared, all over r. So that will cancel one of those, which is it? That should just get, cancel one of those, shouldn't it? Let's just stick the numbers in. Brain's hurting at the moment. So 2 pi times 6.3 times 10 to the 6 meters over the time. Remember, so this is going to be in meters divided by the time, 86,400 seconds, per, because that's how many seconds there are in a day. Square all of that, and then we're going to put that over 6.3 times 10 to the 6 meters. Okay, so let's try this. 2, 2 times pi times 6.3 x 6 divided by 86,400. So it gives a loss of about 458 meters per second. So, yeah, okay, that's going to be the equatorial speed. Uh, square that. 
and then divide by 6.36 equals 0 0.0333 meters per second squared. So that means if I'm sitting on the equator, I experience 0 0.033 meters per second squared. Just out of this, what do I experience at the pole? for centrifugal force, and the answer would be zero. But you'll notice that this occurs at the second decimal place. So at the second decimal place, there is variation on where we are, and this is why there's no point in writing more accurately than 9.81 meters per second squared. I mean, that's going to be measuring for a point there. As you get to the pole, this will get less, due to the centrifugal force, as you, sorry, as you get closer to the crane, so this number will get less due to the centrifugal force. As you get to the pole, it will get greater, because you'd discount that figure there. So, I've already answered that question. Exper exercise 6.8. Is the person person at the pole heavier or light? Um, is the person at the equator Heavier or lighter, or lighter than the person at the pole, um, than a person at the pole, and the answer is, yeah, they're going to be slightly lighter, because you've got, nine, so 9.81 minus that. Now the question is, is this big enough? Is this big enough to have an effect? And the answer is depends what you're talking about. I mean, if you're talking about in a laboratory experiment, I don't know, measuring the speed of light or trying to measure out what the um, heat constant is or stuff like that, no, that's a very small figure. 33 millimetres per second per second squared there usually won't have much effect on any experiment we're doing. However, that's the difference between in here and here. And in reality, the Earth is a big place. And so when, that's meant to be the equator, what happens is we've got different accelerations here and here, and this will actually cause the air to move at different speeds. This is particularly apparent between, yeah, a bit of off the equator from about 10 to 40, 20, 40 degrees. And this causes the air to travel in huge vortices. And if these get big enough, we call these things hurricanes. So while this effect isn't enough to affect which way water goes down tap, it is big enough to affect the atmosphere and to actually cause hurricanes in the atmosphere. So yeah, and they do a lot of damage, they can kill people, they can cause a lot of damage. So this, effect does, this does actually have some effect, but normally in a lab this is too small to worry about as a rule.